It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Sarah Driver, my next guest, just directed a new documentary called Boom for Real, the late teenage years of Jean-Michel Basquiat. The movie shows a side of one of the great 20th century artists that we don't see that much. He's a savvy young upstart painting on walls all over Manhattan's Lower East Side, a teenager. Sarah Driver lived and worked in the same art community that propelled Basquiat to stardom. And because of that, Boom for Real kind of tells two stories. There's Basquiat's. He shows up in archival footage, though, of course, he never speaks. And there's New York City, pre-9-11, pre-Reagan, pre-real estate explosion. Boom for Real strikes a careful balance between nostalgia and danger, between nuance and hero worship. Let's take a listen to a little bit from the movie. In this clip, we'll hear Alexis Adler. In the 70s and 80s, she was a photographer. She has since become an embryologist. She was a good friend of Basquiat's. Together, they'd go to concerts at clubs in New York. And at the time, Basquiat was trying to find a place to live. I found this place on 12th Street. And it was his first stable home, the first place he had a key to. Jean was about 18 and I was about 22. I never felt that he was my boyfriend, but we did have sex and we enjoyed each other's company on a lot of fronts. He was discovering his own art form. Having this apartment allowed him some possibility of working on that, developing it. The walls and floor were his canvas. Sarah Driver, welcome to Bullseye. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. So I guess the obvious question is, why did you want to make a film about Jean-Michel Basquiat, and particularly why this part of his life? Um, well, it, it never really occurred to me to make a film about Jean-Michel. Um, but I went over to Alexis Adler's house, who we heard in the clip, um, after Hurricane Sandy hit New York City in uh, 2012. And I went over to her house, I think it was early January 2013, and she had been a she is a scientist. She's an embryologist, and she'd been looking through a microscope for thirty years and raised two children, and had forgotten about this work that uh, Jean Michel had given her when he moved out of her apartment. Um, and um, and she was very afraid that it had gotten flooded because it was in a bank vault under the street level in an area that was in the flood zone. And she went with her daughter and looked and found what what was in the vault, and it was over 60 works, including writings, drawings, a notebook. Um, and then she remembered she had a box of clothes that he had painted, and we all knew that she lived with Jean-Michel because she had this beautiful mural that he had painted over her bed, of, and it said olive oil on it, and, um, and her bathroom door was painted by him. And... Um, so when I saw everything she had, plus 150 photographs or so that she had taken of him, I thought not only is this a window into him and his development as a young artist, but also it was a really a window into those years in New York that were so particular uh, between 1978 to 1981, um, where there were a lot of young artists coming from all over the country to live in downtown New York, which was pretty much a bombed out zone. I feel like that is a purely New York in 1978 move. Like it's the next level from staying in an apartment because you've got rent control. It's staying in an apartment for 40 years because you have rent control. And also Jean-Michel Basquiat painted some paintings on the walls at one point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have one friend who has a um, a large mural in his co-op apartment, and it's it's, it's a hallway uh mural. So he can, it's actually owned by the co-op, even though it's inside his apartment and was <laughs> painted by his friends. <laughs> Were you around this world in the late 70s and early 80s in New York? Yes. I was um, living in Little Italy and uh, going to school at NYU when I was working on my master's degree in film. And the, the school was actually on uh, 7th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. So it was in the epicenter of the East Village. You spent some time in the film uh, right at the start, trying to set the scene of what New York was like in the late 1970s, and particularly what certain parts of Manhattan were like in the late 1970s. Um, can you describe for our audience who weren't there what, especially the Lower East Side, was like when this story was happening? 
Well, the Lower East Side, you know, they were burning buildings down, the landlords, because it was uh, much more profitable to get insurance money than to have tenants in, in the buildings. Um, it was, it was, it looked kind of like a war zone. And I cut my hair very, very short, about an inch long, and took on the mannerisms of a young man so that I could walk the streets very confidently and not be hassled. And it, this, it was very dangerous, but it was also kind of exciting because, you know, you had to have this very attuned uh, antenna to the street and to the people around you. So you were observing incredible stories all day long, which I feel like, you know, people are now lo- walking around looking at their screens. They're not looking at what the world is around them. And in a way, it was a great privilege to to be in a, such a dangerous place because y- you saw so, m- so many interesting exchanges and you know, we were all going to the same clubs. We were all, um, you know, even if we may not know each other personally, we all knew each other by sight. Um, it was sort of this weird society that just developed because of the, that nobody else really wanted to be in this part of Manhattan. And we, it was affordable. So you could be an artist. You could try all different things. You could try to be a painter. You could try to be a musician. And nobody was in it for the money. It was it was about expressing oneself. And um and you, you paid very little in rent. So you could work in a Xerox shop or, you know, have a part-time job and be able to pay your rent and, and do your art and hang out and go to clubs. And, you know, it was, there were, it was very, very active. What was the relationship between Jean-Michel Basquiat and the graffiti writing scene that was exploding in the late 70s in New York, the kind of hip-hop-oriented graffiti writing scene? Well, he wasn't really a graffiti artist, which I also talk about in the film. Um, although he keeps being referred to as a graffiti artist, he really wasn't one. Um, Al Diaz, who was his partner in SEMA, was a, did come from graffiti culture. And, you know, Jean, he, he, was, he was very provocative. He was, a, he was actually, what I also learned doing this film, is that he was a pretty advanced poet by the time he was 18, 19 years old. The words he was writing on pieces of paper um, and how he was putting them maybe only in two lines and then crossing certain words out that he made clear that you could read. I mean, it was done in a very um, deliberate way. And when he wrote things on the wall, um, he, he wrote very provocative musings, which later are, are, you know, his paintings also have those kinds of musings and writings in them, which also make them so relevant for today and, and so, um, you know, so intriguing is his use of words with his paintings. And it's interesting that as a young artist at 16, 17, he was writing these words in the art air, in the art district of New York. You know, it wasn't other places in New York. It was all in Soho and, you know, which at that time was the art, the center of the art world. I want to play a clip. Michael Holman is an artist and was also a member of the band Gray. And he's in your film and he tells this story about playing a, a show uh, at the Mud Club, which was a social center for this scene um, that was famous for hosting bands like the B-52s and the Talking Heads and so forth. Michael has conceived of this stage set that's going to be this geodesic dome made of uh, garbage and found materials where every member of the band stands in a different part of the geodesic dome. And uh, Jean-Michel like shows up at Soundcheck. He turns around and walks right out. Five minutes later, Jean returns with this shipping crate with Chinese characters written on it, walks up to the stage, tosses this wooden cube onto the stage. Jean scrunches his body up and squeezes his body into this cube. He pulls his little wasp synthesizer in with him and his clarinet and looks out at me and smiles. And I realized that in five minutes, without knowing what we were doing, He goes out into the streets, into the alleys around the mug club and finds this wooden crate that not only works perfectly with the design, but has made him the center of attention. And I was like, you (laughs) motherfucker. Well, one of the images that I really love in the movie, I can't remember who's talking about it, but somebody's talking about 
Jean-Michel walking around the streets of New York with a boom box, or I guess at the time ghetto blaster, and listening to like industrial noise music. Yeah. <laughs> He's a contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> Were there things about him that you remembered from being part of this world that you felt like weren't represented or weren't represented well in the mythologized version of him as, you know, legendary artist with a capital L and a capital A? Well, I just felt like I had a prep when I saw what elect because he was very transient during those years. You know, he was sleeping on all different people's sofas and on floors and um, and Alexis had the foresight, and many people threw out the work that he left at their houses. And Alexis had the foresight, and she also believed from the very beginning that he he was going to be an amazing, you know, an amazing artist. And they wasn't an amazing artist, even as a teenager. And that's why she saved everything. And she saved it also because it was like a keepsake. He was very dear to her. It can be really difficult to describe what is special about Jean-Michel Basquiat's art, especially his visual art. Um, and there are a lot of folks in the movie who just kind of say, well, I saw it and I knew it was it. You spent so much time in making this film with the works. What do you think is compelling or moving uh, about these paintings? Well, I think, you know, I, I just love his use of w words and his love of words. And and his painting is so full of, it's so vibrant, and it just is just full of energy. And I think that's why people are so drawn to it now. And it's so, you know, like so many great artists who almost have a prophet-like uh, uh, kind of demeanor uh, in terms of you know what they're what he said 30 years ago is totally relevant now and it totally as important now as it was 30 years ago and maybe that's just cuz things haven't changed that much or maybe it's because he was very he was absorbing so much and his output was so great he was incredibly prolific um and um you know i i think i think that I love reading his words. I love reading his absurdist play that he had left at Alexis's house, um, which is uh, parts of it are read in the in the film. Um, you know, I think that Rene Ricard said it very well in the Art Forum article when he called him a radiant child because he radiated. He had a kind of light that came out of him that was kind of extraordinary. But he was also just this kid that would you know we'd, you'd see everywhere. One of the great voices in the movie is Lee Quinones, who's a, probably the most eminent graffiti writer of the first great generation of graffiti writers. And he was he had this relationship with Basquiat through, you know, their kind of parallel careers. And what I love is is the way that he talks about the completely different perspective that Basquiat had on the some of the same techniques that the graph writers were using. Let's take a listen to him talking about that in the movie. It was strange to me because it had nothing to do with style. He was like the anti-style. And at that time, I would never want my work to drip. And he was like into letting it drip. He was into letting art be itself. And that's why his work was very you know, crude and maybe childlike in some ways, because, you know, when a child is drawing, there's no, there's no holdings. You know, you're not being held back by anything. You're just going by spirit of the moment. And that in itself made for speed, rapidness. We were painting in rapid session because we didn't want to get caught. But Jean was doing it because he felt and probably knew that he only had a limited amount of time. and. In, in that urgent moment in his life, I don't think he knew that he was going to die, but I think the passing of the moment was very frightening to him. To not have an idea to get created. You know, life and, and art is very fleeting, and uh, he was very much afraid of that, and I think that's what kept his wheels turning faster than everybody else. 
I was really moved by that sentiment. Yeah, Lee's extraordinary. And I, I love Lee because he's talking about, you know, Jean letting his paintings drip. And Lee is actually sitting in his studio with a painting next to him that's dripping all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> He's an, he's an incredible artist, Lee. Yeah, I was so happy to have him in the film. I mean, like, one of the things about it, right, is, like, if you're part of this graffiti culture, like, demonstrating that you have the most technical skill at the time was essential. I mean, that's what he's talking about. Like, you have to develop a new style and you have to – it has to be tight, right? Like, every letter is perfect and it's really wild and – whatever you know it must have blown minds that Basquiat was saying like no I choose for this to be rough and immediate and you know almost uh, almost fleeting like it's not about the circumstance in the way that it is you know you can only see a few words as they go past on a subway train like this is on a wall or this is in on a on a gallery wall but i choose for it to have that kind of intensity and almost ephemerality yeah i mean he, uh, i think marianne Monf monfortin says it really well she says you know it was something to consider you know you'd walk by you'd read it and then you'd consider it and think about it and so you were carrying him around all day long you know <laughs> again he gets the attention <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, uh, the Times Square show is the climax of your film. Can you tell me what the Times Square show was? The Times Square show was a show that was put together by Colab, and but it also included many artists, also Fashion Moda, which was in the South Bronx. Um, and it was downtown artists and uptown artists, and they took over a building in Times Square that was that had been a a whorehouse, um, a massage parlor it was called, and it was many, many rooms, and uh, exhibits were set up in all the rooms, and there was a fashion show, and, you know, Jean used to, would paint the clothes, like as the models walk by, just splash some paint on them, and, um, uh, but, it, you know, it included a lot of artists who then, you know, that, that show was when the actual gallerist from the galleries in Soho started to you know, to come up and check things out. And they started actually to get many of these painters in their galleries from there. It was really the PS1 show right after that, too, <clears throat> really kind of solidified uh, this all being a legitimate art movement. Were those shows that you went to personally? Yes, yes. Everybody went. What did it, what did it feel like to be there? Oh, it was very exciting, and you would see your friends, and you'd see their work, and, you know, it was, uh, and Times Square was always such a trip to go to. I mean, I used to love to go to the movies in Times Square because everybody would talk to the to the screens, you know, they'd start screaming at, at the, the characters in the film and stuff. They were always very lively. <laughs> so. But it was always tricky, too, on the subway, too late at night, coming going back downtown from Times Square. Did you ever, did you grow your hair back out at some point? <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I, you know, things sort of got a little tamer in the, I guess, mid-80s or so. And less interesting. <laughs> I was just talking to somebody on the show a couple of weeks ago about the moment when you realize that, you know, you, you are walking around with someone in the city and they don't have their you know they don't have their head up and their antenna out the same way that you do and you have this thought like oh come on quit being such a weakling like you're going to get you know you're going to get got you know like somebody's going to somebody's going to roll up on you or something bad is going to happen because you're you're being a wuss and you're not paying attention and you're acting like you own the place and then <laughs> and then you realize like oh maybe that isn't something that's wrong with them maybe that's something that's wrong with you <laughs> You're like, oh, maybe it's okay not to be on alert all the time. Yeah, but there's some gifts that you get on alert. You know, it's funny. We had Whole Foods open about two blocks away from us, and I was over at, the, at Robert Frank, the photographer's house, and um, 
and Robert, he was about 90 at the time, and um, and I said, Robert, it's so great. We have Whole Foods. It's like two blocks away. I used to have to walk 15 blocks for food, and actually his wife, who's a wonderful artist, June Leaf, she and I went to the opening of Whole Foods. We were so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Robert said to me, he goes, but Sarah, think of all those things you would have seen in those 15 blocks. You know, you don't have the same city experience anymore. How would you say the vibe at the Whole Foods opening compared with the, the Times Square show? <laughs> it was a totally different vibe. <laughs> but I'm very interested in food as I am art, so. <laughs> I mean, better macaroni and cheese at the Whole Foods opening. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think we ate at the um, Ukrainian National Home. That was our big treat. And you'd get lamb chops and applesauce and a potato for $3.95 or something. <laughs> that was like our big meal. <laughs> um, but I think you know I, I I think you know now you don't you don't get those kind of gifts anymore the way you did you know because it's become so rich and there's it's not as varied as it once was. Sarah Driver, thank you so much for talking to me on Bullseye. It was uh, so nice to get to see your film and to get to meet you. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. Sarah Driver. Her film, Boom for Real, The Late Teenage Years of Jean-Michel Basquiat, is playing now in select theaters. 